there, my name is Emma and I'm here to preview the 240 study guide that will help you get in the classroom. If you're ready to see the real thing, click this link right here right now or check out the free practice test below in the description. In this video, I'll dive into the Texas Life Science 7 through 12 exam. That's test 238. This video is gonna cover three things. What content will be covered on the test and how to study for it. The most likely concepts or themes that you'll see on the exam and we're gonna look at a few practice questions. Are you ready to tackle this exam? Let's go. Life Science 7 through 12 is broken into six sections called domains. These account for between 10 to 20% of the exam. Each domain covers multiple educator standards and contains multiple competencies, which are necessary for you to know. We'll briefly go over each domain, and then we'll finish with six practice questions to make sure you're ready for success. Let's start with domain one, scientific inquiry and processes. With three competencies, this domain covers the teaching, nature, and history of science. Science provides an opportunity for students to investigate the natural world, both in the classroom and outdoors. The safe use of tools, materials, and equipment is crucial here. Some common safety practices to teach include never put chemicals back into the container to avoid contamination, properly dispose of excess chemicals in liquid waste bottles, Always wear safety goggles and closed toe shoes when working with glass, chemicals, fire, or projectiles. Tie back hair and loose clothing when working with fire and machines. Wash hands before and after experiments. Direct the openings of containers away from faces. Never use or touch chipped or broken glass directly. Do not eat or drink in the lab. Never directly smell chemicals. Instead, waft the air toward the face. Do not taste chemicals. Keep water and objects away from electrical outlets. Always notify the teacher in the case of a spill or accident. Teachers should address spills immediately and minimize spread. Turn off all gas and electrical equipment when not in use. And never leave flames or moving equipment unattended. Nice, that's one domain down, let's keep going. In domain two, cell structure and processes, you'll cover topics ranging from biomolecules to cell growth and processes and more. That's four competencies. Let's dive into one of the most important materials in this domain, parts of the cell. All cells are composed of many smaller structures that perform specific jobs. Organelles are membrane-bound structures within a eukaryotic cell. You can think of them as little organs for the cell, hence the name organelles. Certain cells will have fewer or greater specific organelles depending on the cell's job. Take a look at these generic plant and animal cells. The organelles have been labeled. You can see how many terms you'll need to know. But for now, just remember this. Plant and animal cells share many organelles, but a few differ. Plant cells can have chloroplasts, cell walls, and a large central vacuole. Animal cells can have centrioles and lysosomes. And that's the end of this domain. Way to go. But let's keep moving right into domain three, heredity and evolution of life. This domain spans another four competencies, from the mechanisms of genetics to evolutionary change in Earth's history. So just all of Earth's history, no big deal, right? But for now, let's talk about Punnett squares. The Punnett square is a type of probability organizer to show you each possible combination from the alleles of two parents. Let's make a Punnett square together. To create one for a single trait, draw four boxes in a two by two arrangement. We'll write one parent's genes above the squares, putting one allele above each column. Then we'll write the second parent's genes to the left of the squares, putting one allele to the left of each row. In the case of pea plants, purple flowers are a dominant trait and white flowers are a recessive trait. The male plant has a heterozygous genotype, capital B, lowercase b, and has a purple flower. The female plant has a homozygous recessive genotype, lowercase b, lowercase b, and a white flower. We'll fill in the Punnett square by carrying the top parent's genes into each box directly below it. Next, we'll carry the genes from the parent on the left into each box on the right. Finally, we'll analyze the genotypes and phenotypes of the results. Because there are four boxes, each box represents a 25% chance of getting an offspring with that genotype. Now we can see there is a 50% chance an offspring from these two parents will have white flowers or homozygous recessive, and a 50% chance it will have purple flowers or heterozygous. If you love learning with videos, the 240 study guide is right for you. Next up is diversity of life, which includes four more competencies. 
These cover the differences and similarities between organisms, and that's only the beginning. An important definition here is homeostasis. Organisms need to remain in an ideal state for their biological processes. To do this, organisms perform work to remain in homeostasis, a relatively stable state. This occurs at many levels. In a multicellular organism, organ systems interact with one another to correct imbalances in its systems and return to homeostasis. For example, the lungs, kidneys, and brain of mammals work together to maintain the ideal pH of the blood. Some organisms use internal energy to remain at the right body temperature. Humans need to maintain a body temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. If a person gets too hot, their skin sweats to reduce their temperature. If they get too cold, their muscles shiver to warm up. Fun fact, most mammals have similar adaptations. Okay, let's keep the ball rolling with domain five, interdependence of life and environmental systems. These three competencies deeply explore living things in terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. Ecosystems contain many organisms linked by food and energy relationships. Food webs show these overlapping food chains. Let's take a look at some food webs to see a complex and detailed picture of flowing energy. In this food web, if the frog population died out, there would be no food for the snake population, and it would also die out. Then the wolf population would have to depend more on the squirrels and birds, which might get overhunted. On the other hand, the bugs and grass the frog used to eat might have an increase in population. Sometimes food webs are drawn as ecological pyramids. This is when organisms are classified by how they get their food and assigned a trophic level. Take a look at the terms here. You'll need to be able to define producers, consumers, and decomposers. Here's a helpful hint. Organisms that make their own food are called producers. Think of them as makers. All other organisms are consumers and must find and consume food. Okay, way to go. We finally reached domain six, science learning, instruction, and assessment. This domain includes our final two competencies, which delve deep into scientific instruction. There are many types of learning covered here, but for today, we'll talk more about inquiry-based learning. Inquiry-based learning centers around developing and answering questions or solving problems from the real world. Students learn as they develop investigations, perform experiments, and seek answers with teacher-guided conversations and activities. So why is this important in science? Well, science involves discovery and investigation. Students must do, not just read or listen. Students learn in three key phases, assimilation, accommodation, and organization. Assimilation means individuals take in information through their senses. Accommodation is that aha moment as students figure out why their experiences make sense. Organization means storing this new information and relating it to what students already know and understand about the world. Okay, we went over all six domains. Now let's look at a practice question from each one. We're starting with domain one, scientific inquiry and processes. When is the best time to remind students about the lab safety rules? Remember that list of lab safety practices? Now ask yourself, when is the best time to address these with students so they can better remember and apply the specific safety rules to the equipment? The answer is A. Okay, great start. Let's move on to domain two, cell structure and processes. Which of the following is present in plant cells but not in animal cells? Okay, remember those graphics we saw earlier? With those in mind, the correct answer has to be also A. Chloroplast is the food producer of the cell. It is only found in plant cells. Okay, let's hop into domain three, heredity and evolution of life. For a class experiment, Mark pollinates two red flowering plants. One of the plants created in the experiment produces white flowers. Which of the following is an inference Mark could make? Let's break it down. If both parents are red, but produced a white flower, the gene for being red must be a dominant trait. If both parents' genotypes were homozygous dominant, their offspring would also all have red flowers. Therefore, the parents must have heterozygous genotypes. 25% of their offspring would have homozygous recessive genotypes, creating white flowers. That means there's only one answer, B. Wow, we're already halfway there. Let's keep up our momentum with domain four, diversity of life. Which of the following does not help mammals maintain or increase body warmth in cold weather? This is a tricky one. Do you have your answer ready? The correct answer is C, 
As perspiration, or sweat, evaporates off the skin, the skin is cooled. Perspiring helps the body reduce body heat, not maintain or increase it. Next up is Domain 5, Interdependence of Life and Environmental Systems. Mr. Buller is teaching his students about food webs. Which of the following activities would be most effective as an engagement activity? There's only one answer that allows students to actively participate and work with others to figure out where their organism fits in the complex feeding relationships of the ecosystem. And that answer is D. Okay, just one more. Let's tackle domain six, science learning, instruction, and assessment. Mr. Malone's seventh grade science class is beginning a unit on living things. Mr. Malone would like to engage his students in an inquiry-based activity. Which of the following activities would be the most effective? Consider these activities. Which one allows students to develop their own activities and encourages an atmosphere of scientific inquiry? The correct answer here is A. Okay, we made it to the finish line. You've officially completed our Texas Life Science 7 through 12 exam overview. Congratulations on finishing the video. If you found it helpful, give it a like. But there's still plenty more to learn. Did you know that our study guide has hundreds of practice questions? If you really want to make sure that you're prepared for the Texas Life Science 7 through 12 exam, take the next step and subscribe to the 240 study guide. It has hours of videos so you can watch or listen while doing chores. It's test aligned so you know precisely what you need to study. It has hundreds of practice questions so you can be sure you're ready. And best of all, it has the money back guarantee. So click the link below right now to get started.